Let's join together in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for your presence that's real and moving, that's active and stirring. Precious God, we thank you for the reality of your being that lights the path for us to follow. Just as we light the candles each week in worship, we celebrate that light that burns before us, that gives us a focal point to look at as we gaze through the darkness for the spark of hope. Be with us today, God, through this conversation. Amen. Thank you all for coming. I think some of you came because you thought I wasn't going to be here. <laughs> but again, I'll share with you, some, in, some of you came in after the announcements. Thankfully for the blessings of a negative COVID test, here I am. Well, we do have a dear friend that we want you to pray for because COVID is still real and still an issue. And we have a friend that is dealing with that right now. But today, I want us to look at love as we continue to deal with the idea of Jesus Christ from the narrative of his birth to the death, burial, and resurrection being the image of what it means to turn power over and giving a source of light to those who feel that they're not so much stuck in the darkness, but forced into it. I want us to look at it through these words. It comes from Paul's first letter to the church of Corinth. And I want to share with you a very memorable story I had from one of my first pastoral mentors. There's one place we hear this scripture the most frequently. It's at weddings. There's a proclamation of what love is as we celebrate in that beautiful setting what love can create. A love between two individuals who want to combine their lives together and go on a journey together and celebrate what love is. This pastoral mentor once shared with me if these families actually read this scripture for what it is actually saying, they not only would not want it read at their wedding, they would want to take it out of the Bible and ignore it. Because where this is a celebration of what love is, it's also a proclamation and a challenge of what we have to do to help love be what it is. Love is what John Wesley taught. Love is justifying grace. Love is the moment that we realize that there's something greater than us that exists outside of us, and we have this longing desire to interact with it. That's what we proclaim at a wedding. There's this other individual whose life has existed outside of ours for so long, and we want that moment that our lives combine together so that we can move forward on a journey supporting each other, both sides having an equal responsibility of participation. That's justifying grace. Jesus Christ already did the actions. He was born. He lived, he taught, he walked with the community and displayed through his actions the difference that could be made in the new way. Jesus Christ displayed in his conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus Christ displayed in his conversation with the lady caught in adultery. Jesus Christ displayed at a dinner table one evening when a Gentile came over to participate in the blessings of Christ's communications, Jesus Christ, through his living and interaction, displayed that the ones that we once thought were left less than have a place at the table. And it comes from the desire of wanting to interact wholeheartedly with this source of love and grace that exists outside of us. 
just like the wedding vows. When we vow to love, honor, cherish, support in all means and in all ways, we acknowledge that there is this being outside of us that we want to be connected to. And we voice our commitment to them. Many of us through our infant baptisms, many of us through confirmation, Many of us who walk down the aisle at Cornerstone Baptist Church as a 14-year-old have had that one moment that we said above all things that Jesus Christ is important to me and I want to live my life within that importance. We're going to celebrate that today with the scripture that Andy so eloquently read about what love is. And you could probably actually say the word eloquently. There, I got it right the second try. We're going to use the words of Fred Rogers real quick. And Ray, if you'll show the next slide, it should be a quote from Fred Rogers. And I want us to hold on to this idea, not just for this morning, as we look at what love is, but as we go out and we deal with disappointment, frustration, and even at times anger when love isn't being what we desire it to be, at least what we're looking for. Love isn't a state of perfect caring. It is an active noun like struggle. To love someone is to strive to accept that person exactly the way he or she is right here and now. I want us to hold on to those words. I want us to look at these words about how love is an active struggle, and I want us to begin to pray how we take that active nature into reviewing the Scripture. Right, next slide, please. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And I'll add in the first part of the next verse. Love never fails. When we look at that, go back to the scripture. Thank you. As we look at that scripture, we see the active challenge that the Apostle Paul is sharing. And there is no one more suited to share this challenge than the Apostle Paul. I want us to look at the entire narrative of the Apostle Paul's life today as we look at what it means to be individuals looking for places of redemption, being individuals looking for places at the table of grace, being individuals who can find a place that we are set free by God's love and know that we are fully included in that love. We have to go back years upon years and look at a tent maker by the name of Saul who was so frustrated with the ones that he called that were called Christians that he was one of the principal tormentors of these individuals. This individual, Saul, was at the stoning of Stephen. This individual, Saul, one day went on a journey to Damascus with the sole focus of taking that torment to another collection of believers so that he could quelch this movement and put things back the way they were. This individual, Saul. One who wanted to stop the progress. Something happened to Saul on this journey to Damascus as he was going with the intention to persecute. He was stricken blind and fell to the ground. 
in a moment of taking away sight. I've always seen it as a moment that God took away the things that Saul was looking for. He took away the sight that Saul had. He took away the agendas and the purposes that Saul had. And within that blindness, having his own personal sight taken away, having his agendas removed, Saul was forced to see things in a new way. Mud was put on his eyes, the scales were removed, and Saul looked up and saw the hope that exists in the reality of Jesus Christ. His life was so changed and transformed that God himself renamed him that day. Saul the persecutor, the one who hated, the one whose agenda was to quench the movement, became Paul. If you look at your Bibles and open it up to the New Testament, and then you take the Gospels away, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all the rest of that is Paul. So we get to Revelations and so forth. But over half of the New Testament is Paul. We have this individual who was so agenda-driven and locked that he was blinded to the reality of what grace could be. And in one moment, he was forced to be within this active struggle that Fred Rogers explains. It was an action, active struggle of being blinded to his agendas to see the reality of what grace was calling for. And Paul got up and went forward to be the voice of the new way. No longer the tormentor, but the voice. Next slide, Ray. I like this quote very much because it exists within the narrative of Paul, and it exists within our narratives as well. If we are a part of this active struggle of living within love, we are also struggling with ourselves at times. The greatest gift you ever give is your honest self. The greatest gift you ever give is your honest self. Next slide. Sorry, go back. I thought it was the scripture. I messed up. Let's think about the scripture for a moment. Let's think about this journey of the Apostle Paul. And let's talk about this honesty of being honest with who we are. Many times it's easy to connect our active struggle with love by affixing it to another person. I've shared in many scriptures, it's easy to remember the greatest commandment is to love your Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your strength, and to love your neighbor. That is the easiest thing to remember, and we're willing to go through that struggle for other people. As we look at the journey of the wedding vows, we are making a proclamation that we are willing to go through a struggle with another person to find common grounds and love, but we cannot fully participate in that journey until that we are willing to go on that struggle with ourselves. The Apostle Paul immediately has to deal with that struggle, immediately has to deal with that struggle. As the Holy Spirit, as Christ himself, wipes the scales away from his eyes so that he can see the wholeness of what grace is, the first thing Paul is asked to do is continue his journey to Damascus. Let's think about that. When we find our places in faith, the first thing that comes along in our lives that tries to bump us off of that path is who we once were. I have heard so many times because I have said the words myself, I can't do this because I. I can't do this because I once. I can't do this because of one mistake. 
The first thing that faith gives us the opportunity to do is to look at our pure and honest selves and see the beautiful creation that Jesus Christ has made with us. We see the patience. We see the love, the struggle, the kindness that exists in love, and we are immediately challenged through the grace of the Holy Spirit to acknowledge that within ourselves and celebrate that within ourselves so that we can step away from what was and become what is new. The statement that the pastor said after my baptism was arise and go forth and walk in newness of life. That's the reality that we celebrate when we find our connection, these actions of justifying grace with the love of God. We find the honesty that God loves us, and we live within the honesty that we are worthy of that love. And then we can go forth and not just confront the things that once held us back, but to show them such new newness that they feel the love as well. And that was the first thing Paul had to do. But let's add the dangers in that. We all exist in a culture where people become afraid when they see change, and they want to quench that change as well. So many loving, caring relationships exist with souls, individuals that are afraid of change and afraid of what that change might mean and is afraid of seeing the new faces and the new hearts and the new opportunities, that their first challenge is to quench it and stop it, and that's what Paul was moving into. They knew he was coming. They were waiting for Saul. But thankfully, because of the voice of a mentor who had already began sharing with others what had happened and Paul's willingness to continue on the journey, they saw a new way and a new love because Paul was willing to be honest with himself and continue on the journey. I want you to remember the song that I played during children's time. Anytime that you feel less than, any time that you feel unimportant, any time that you remember the heart you broke when you were 16 years old or the mistake you made in college or relationships that are no longer and you wish they were, I want you to remember the words that still echo, it's you I like. It's you I like. It's not the clothes you wear the way you do your hair. It's not your toys they just set beside you. It's you. It's you I like. When we can remember that we hold true value and grace, hope serves. Now the next slide. The toughest thing is to love somebody who has done something mean to you. Especially that some when that somebody has been yourself. I'm going to read it again because I fumbled it. The toughest thing is to love somebody who has done something mean to you, especially when that somebody has been yourself. I want us to think about this reality as we look at what love is. Love is patient, love is kind. Love is not self-seeking. It does not boast. When we look at these words, these active words of what it means to participate with love, we begin to see that the only thing that separates us from grace is ourselves. Many years ago, I went to an FCA camp. And this is when Peyton Manning was still playing for Tennessee because our FCA, our college FCA, went to the same FCA camp that the volunteers went to, and I got to meet Peyton Manning. But during that scripture time, there was this former NFL football player, and he had to weigh 350 pounds, not an ounce of fat on him. And when he clamped his hands together, his shirt rippled up. 
was a very frightening thing. But he gave this image of grace that I still hold on to today. He said, I want you to keep this in your mind. Now, I don't have the muscle mass that this gentleman had, so he might not get the same effect that I did. But imagine that I'm 350 pounds, Arnold Schwarzenegger, the Lou Ferrigno type guy. He said, this is God's man. And this is you. And this is God's other man. So then he clamped down, and his muscle flexed out his shirt, bubbled up, and there's nothing that can take you out of that protection. I wish I had a picture of that guy, because I'm not this plan, right? I don't have the muscles for it. This is God's hand. This is you. This is God's hand. And there's nothing that can take you from this. I want you to hold on to that reality because so many times I've been in conversations with individuals who say, I don't feel that God loves me. And the biggest hindrance of that is the journey that they're on to understand that they can love themselves. The toughest thing is to love somebody who has done something mean to you, especially when that somebody has been you. I don't just want, I need. I need you to remember that there's nothing that can take God away from me. I need you to remember that there's nothing that separates us from God's love. My understanding of justifying grace is Jesus Christ is always, 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 always reaching out for us. We just need to reach back. Is the next slide scripture? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. I'm sure that's a beautiful quote, but I've thrown the wrong glasses today. But look at that loving face. I may not be able to look like a 350-pound muscle builder, but we can all have that face. That face of kindness, that face of love, that face of support. And I want you to see that face when you look in the mirror. I want us to remember if a tormentor to the new way can find his place in that transformation and become the major voice of the new way, there's nothing that can stop you from being a part of it.